Good afternoon on today's Angry Bulletin. My friend and colleague Ellie in Space carried out a fantastic interview, the sort of interview I think that any content creator would love to get, an interview with Elon Musk. And it was very well handled. That being said, though, there are a few questions that I hope she gets a chance to ask next time she gets an interview with Elon, which, by the way, I'm pretty sure she's going to get given how well this last one went. All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon once again. Welcome to another Angry Bulletin. This one again about Starship, or more specifically, a recent incredible interview carried out by Ellie in Space, my good friend. Uh, we've been friends and colleagues for some time now. A wonderful lady who just surpassed over 100,000 subscribers quite easily because of the enormous number of views that she got on this video. Very well deserved. And she worked for a long time to get that. Spent a lot of time networking at Starbase, doing everything that she was supposed to do to eventually secure this interview, and she indeed did it. Again, I think that that should be a pretty strong indication that she is a professional journalist who has had years of experience in journalism and I'm not. That having been said, though, there are a number of things that I wish Ellie had asked during that interview. Not This is not a critique. I want to be 100% clear about this. I think Ellie just absolutely killed it on this interview. I want to be 100% clear on that. I am not trying to criticize Ellie. Rather, what I'd like to see is a few more questions about specifics the next time when it comes to things that may challenge SpaceX and challenge Starship's eventual obligations, especially when it comes to Artemis. Now, once again, I don't even know if Ellie had the freedom to ask these kinds of questions. I haven't actually spoken to her about any of this. I gave her a heads up that I was going to be doing this video, but I didn't really get a chance to talk to her in depth about what she was permitted to ask and what she wasn't. There can be very, very significant restrictions on a journal in terms of what kind of questions they're allowed to ask. I've faced that many times myself. A lot of my interviews with Sierra Space, Lockheed Martin, I was told very specifically that I couldn't ask questions about specific contractual obligations, the progress on specific technologies, etc. And that may indeed have been what her situation was as well. But nevertheless, what I'd like to do is just cover a few questions that I hope Ellie gets a chance to ask in the future. The kinds of questions that honestly, I don't think many other people are going to ask. I don't think I'm going to get a chance to ask these questions because I've frankly been very critical of SpaceX and Elon questioning launch dates, questioning estimates on when Starship is actually going to be ready to go to orbit, that sort of thing. I have a feeling that SpaceX may regard me as being a bit more of an adversarial journalist than most. So I have a feeling I'm probably not going to get this opportunity. So I'd really like to see these questions get asked in the future. Once again, not criticizing it at all because Ellie asked some very good questions, was well prepared, and it was a great interview. I mean, an interview handled by a consummate professional. And uh, definitely congratulations to you on this amazing accomplishment, Ellie. But nevertheless, next time you see, see Elon, and I have a feeling you probably will, I'd like to see whether or not you might be willing to ask some questions like this. Uh, for this launch, we, we hit two key reusability milestones, which was having the booster boost back um, to a precise location and uh, execute a landing boon and land softly in the water, which it did. Now, we saw you post on X that maybe Flight 5 you'll attempt to catch. How, what do you think is the likelihood of that? Well, I, I need to regroup with the team and confirm that there aren't any other known issues, but. I think uh, g given that the booster came back, uh, came to a precise location, came to uh, essentially zero velocity landing uh, on the ocean, I, I, think we, uh, I think we should probably try to catch it with the tower arms on the next flight. Um, absolutely.
Well, I think all of us want to see a tower catch, but I have some concerns. It appears that the booster during this landing attempt may have been on fire. This bore a lot of similarity to the landing of SN10 back in 2021, which by the way, was on fire and exploded subsequently. Is there a concern perhaps about a booster trying to conduct a chopsticks landing while a fire issue may be ongoing. The methane propellant that SpaceX is making use of has been notorious for having fire issues during previous tests. Can't help but wonder if that might be an issue while they're trying to conduct a chopsticks capture. And even if, if there wasn't a fire, and incidentally, I'm not even sure if Ellie had a chance to see the footage that we're watching right now before she conducted that interview, there was clearly some debris that flew past the booster while the engines were being engaged, as if perhaps an engine exploded during the landing procedure. If there was an engine explosion, would a chopsticks capture be a bit problematic? I guess I would have liked to have known a few details about that landing to see whether or not we perhaps need another ocean landing attempt before they do the chopsticks landing, or if they're going to go straight to the chopsticks landing, is there no reason to be concerned? Now, Elon said that there were two objectives which Starship achieved that day. What was the other one? Um, and getting the ship to go all the way through um, the super high heating of reentry where it's coming in like a meteor um, and, uh, and then maintain control subsonically and uh, land in a pretty precise, precise location. Uh, well, it was technically six kilometers off geographically, but it was able to, the ship was able to maintain control and then relight the, the three uh, rafter engines for, for a for landing. Uh, as you were watching, people are saying on X, the little flap that could, what, what, what was going through your mind? I was surprised that the flap lasted so long. So it's, uh, you know, because it's, when, once the heat chill tiles are gone, the, uh, you, you really just have um, bare steel, which is mostly the sort of uh, SX300 uh, steel alloy. And uh, it, was, it was actually quite surprising how well the steel uh, held up. Uh, despite the extreme heating. Yeah. So I, I, I thought the flap would fail uh, because it, it's not supposed to be able to survive, but it did. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Musk, what did you just say? Because it, it's not supposed to be able to survive, but it did. After all the time that SpaceX has had to work on the heat shield and any weak points that it might have had over all the years they've been preparing for this re-entry attempt, why would the flaps not supposed to have been able to survive? Why would that kind of weakness have been included in the design? And to be clear, according to Tim Dodd, Elon did identify that this was a weakness that they were going to take care of sometime in the future, but nevertheless, it would have been nice to know why this sort of problem exists in the first place. Also, Elon mentioned that once the heat tiles are gone, all there is is bare steel left. That's actually the case with the entire heat shield. So I'd also like to know, did any other parts of the heat shield suffer damage? I mean, I think we can be pretty safe in assuming that the other flap sustained about as much damage as this flap did if the two had similar weaknesses but what about the rest of the shield? Did other heat tiles come away from the vehicle? I think they probably did. And if that's the case, did other parts of the rocket also sustain damage? Did Elon know if that was the case or not? By the way, look at the soot accumulating on that camera lens and actually it gets cracked by debris a bit later on in the process as well. I think it would have just would have been nice to know what Elon's assessment of the performance of the heat shield actually actually was. Do we have a lot of work to do on it? Not very much work to do. Is it going to be a problem that's going to be completely rectified by the fifth flight? Or do we have several flights to go before we can expect this ship to be able to completely survive and be reused sometime in the future? I guess a simple way to ask the question would be, given what happened to the ship this time, Mr. Musk, what's the road to 100% reusability? Also, later on, Ellie asked 
asks about the prospects of going to Mars, how that's going to look eventually, whether he felt confident about Starship eventually going to Mars. Great question. I would have, however, liked to have heard a question like this. According to NASA, Lunar Starship will be putting astronauts on the surface of the moon in the third quarter of 2026, a little over two years from now. Given where we are with Starship's development, what's the road ahead look like? How do you foresee Starship is going to go from what we saw yesterday to eventually putting astronauts on the surface of the moon? Do you think that can be done in a couple of years? And if so, how? And by the way, I totally understand that I'm Monday morning quarterbacking this whole thing, and these are the kinds of questions that I like to ask, certainly not necessarily the kinds of questions that Ellie or her viewers would want to have asked, but nevertheless, I think that these are the sorts of things that we need to challenge SpaceX on in the future as we get closer and closer to returning mankind to the moon, which should be a very important objective for our spaceflight endeavors right now. And then there was one last, I think, really good question that Ellie asked, and the answer was a bit bizarre. At what point do you think it would be safe for people to bring or have children on Mars? Uh, well, I think you, you can have children on Mars as soon as you're able to. Now, to be fair, Elon goes on to say that bringing children along for the first decade or so probably isn't the best idea because it isn't going to be very safe to transport children for quite some time. But at the beginning, what he said was very strange indeed. You can have children as soon as you're able to. He doesn't seem to realize that there might be an issue with a one-third gravity versus a full G and the effects that that might have on gestation and other things, because I'm pretty sure that's what Ellie was asking about. And Elon either doesn't seem to know that that's potentially a problem, or he just doesn't think that it is going to be a problem. In any event, that whole thing was a little weird and I might have pressed him on it and said well yeah according to scientists having a child and gestating a child in one-third gravity might be a problem what do you think I don't know. In any event, not sure if I would have pressed him on it in that situation, to be honest, because Elon has some very, very clear ideas about the human race having as many children as possible right now, given the fact that the populations of many countries are plunging during due to low birth rates. But still, that was a little odd. But in conclusion, once again, it's easy for me to Monday morning quarterback this stuff, and I must emphasize that I think it was an incredible interview. I don't think I will ever be able to secure an interview with Elon Musk, and it is fantastic that Ellie managed to do that. Also, she asked some very good and informed questions compared to most journalists who would have queried Elon Musk on things involving SpaceX, going to Mars, etc. Pretty sure that very few of them would have had the slightest idea of what sorts of questions to ask him. So overall, fantastic job, Ellie. But next time, yeah, maybe try to keep some of these questions in your back pocket if you're in the mood to. Once again, thanks everyone for watching. Really appreciate it. Please like, please subscribe. Also, please subscribe to Ellie in Space. She's already surging in her membership right now as she should be in the aftermath of this interview. But nevertheless, let's keep that momentum going. Also, please consider supporting this channel on Patreon. And as always, stay angry about space.